In this series on the uh, autonomic nervous system, we're going to be taking a, at first an overview look of the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, aspects of the nervous system and leading to uh, studying each individually and then going on to looking at drug classes that we use, just the classes, not specific drugs, and conditions that we treat with autonomic drugs. The scope of this series will not include the somatic nervous system, as this would take us a little bit longer. But we'd really want to focus in on the autonomic side of things uh, with its integration. And it's uh, two divisions, parasympathetic and sympathetic, sympathetic. And the fact that the parasympathetic nervous system really is focused to uh, innervation taking the message to individual tissues, uh, including glands, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, whereas the sympathetic nervous system is meant to kind of bring all boats on board um, and get re ready to stimulate all at the same time. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the adrenal medulla as it leads to diffuse activation. You may want to take a look at this graphic a little more in detail if it's not the kind of thing you're familiar with. Um, but what I want to focus on in this uh, slide is really the difference between the innervation. And that is to point out that the sympathetic nervous system and its ganglia tend to be at a distance from the end, what I'll call the end effectors, which are these things on the, on the right. End effectors include muscle, glands, etc. Uh, so th that's the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system, we'll note, has its ganglion very close to or in the tissue. Uh, and this is the way it's part of its uh, strategy to lead to a discrete um, ner nervous system directed type of activation of that tissue. Uh, and again, we're going to call these end effectors. So when I say end effector, tissue, or cell, this is going to be anything. It could be another neuron, but most of the time it's a non-neuronal tissue. And of course, the adrenal medulla is its special case where it is obviously being uh, stimulated. It is a ganglion itself, and it's releasing uh, particularly epinephrine, a little bit of norepinephrine into the circulation. And that leads to even more diffuse uh, stimulation, as we'll talk about later. Before we dig down into each of the separate um, systems, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, I think it's very useful to realize how the body organizes this or integrates this. It basically, most organs received dual uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. However, some organs only receive sympathetic, and those are listed here, spleen, sweat glands, pyloerector muscles in uh, animals, and most blood vessels. The next two slides are really something you probably want to uh, take some time on your own and, and study, but I wanted to make the point here that uh, I'm going to be using examples uh, both for physiology, pharmacology, and clinical conditions of in the heart, uh, usually in the vessels, uh, the bronchial tree, and the GI tract. Furthermore, we'll take a look at the urinary bladder, um, the eye, and of course secretions in general uh, from the various uh, salivary, submandibular, and parotid glands. What I'd like to offer to you as a way of organizing your thinking about um, the integration of the autonomic nervous system is the concept of tone, autonomic tone. And that means that in most of the systems, most of the organs are jointly innervated in that the uh, tissue is under the influence of one or the other of the arms of the autonomic nervous system to one extent or another. Usually it's not absolutely balanced, it's usually one has a greater effect than the other. Sort of the yin-yang effect of the uh, autonomic nervous system. 
So what are those possibilities? There really are three. Uh, you can have effects that are opposing each other, which you see, and we'll give you examples in the, the respiratory bronchial muscle and the heart. Uh, you can have complementary effects, which you see in the skeletal muscle vasculature, uh, suggesting the blood flow to there can be an effect of both uh, arms of the autonomic nervous system, um, one more than the other. In this case, the sympathetic seems to have a greater control over that. And then there's a way, there's a mechanism where there's really no direct interaction, but there's sort of anatomically different structures. And the example here is their control of the pupil in the eye. They're two separate muscles. One is controlled by the parasympathetic system, and that's the uh, sphincter muscle. And the other is by the sympathetic nervous system, and that's the radial muscle that controls pupillary diameter. So in, in this slide, basically, I want to really summarize this, this unit um, and, and use it to finalize your thinking around the concept of tone. Um, and so, again, if you look here, uh, you can have something that's, you know, this is the theoretical of balanced, if you will, between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic pulling like a spring, springs in opposite directions on a mass, and that mass moves in one direction or the other. And we're going to say that the strongest spring is the one that kind of dominates or defines tone for that tissue. Uh, we would have something that looks like this when we have parasympathetic. We're, we're favoring the parasympathetic nervous system. And conversely, with the sympathetic nervous system, that spring is going to pull towards a uh, dominant effect of the sympathetic nervous system. That does not mean the other side is not present. It doesn't um, become uh, active. But where this becomes crucial is for your understanding of the potential therapeutic potential of antagonists. For example, an antagonist against the uh, parasympathetic tone would move that, that would have a great effect to move towards more dominance of sympathetic. And so that antagonist has a better chance in that tissue of working than an antagonist that might be directed at the uh, a blocker that might be directed at the sympathetic nervous system. And conversely, in a tissue where tone is sympathetic, the, and I'll use an example here uh, of the uh, vasculature. So let's say the sympathetic tone of the, that controls blood pressure, alpha blockers, alpha-1 adrenergic antagonists are very useful for managing blood pressure because sympathetic tone seems to dominate it. And when we block that sympathetic tone, we can have a significant clinical effect. Conversely, if I were to use uh, the example of a uh, muscarinic antagonist on the parasympathetic side for that, it would have very little effect on blood pressure. So if you look on the, the list on the left, this is again something I really think you, through practice and are looking at uh, clinical scenarios, you'll get that practice. The GI tract, parasympathetic, should it make sense. Cardiac is actually parasympathetic, controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. Think of the vegetative functions. Um, bladder and smooth muscle, parasympathetic. Bladder, smooth muscle. Iris muscles, parasympathetic. The, obviously, the radial muscles are sympathetic. We said those are completely separate. Uh, the vasculature... Uh, itself, we talked about already, is sympathetic, and the bronchioles of the respiratory tree are sympathetic. These are the major organ systems that I'm going to be discussing as we move forward in these units.